What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the third episode of Buffalo Dash. It's great to see you all again. Let's dive right into the first segment of our show. So, as we know, the college football season for the Pac-12 has been postponed to at least January 1st. But that being said, I'm still now going to go through the pre-COVID schedule and break down some games, see really what Colorado was made of going up against uh, our non-conference and our Pac-12 opponents and see at the end what our record would have been. Here's my prediction, 6-6. Six and six. It's good. It's better than 5-7 and seven last year. I think there's a game or two in there that we can win. Um, the most obvious wins is week one, we march into Colorado State, into Fort Collins. Colorado travels really well. We go in there, we get a win, we start the season right, 1-0. And we come back home against Fresno State week two. This game was supposed to be played back in 2013, but it unfortunately got postponed. But lucky for us, we get it, we, had, we get to have been played it this year. We come back home. They come to Colorado. They don't play at altitude. We play at altitude. We win that game. We're 2-0. And then our first real test of the season would have been week three, us going into College Station, Texas A&M. Now, Texas A&M was going to be Probably a top 25 team in the country. Um, they had a really good quarterback. Um, I, I really don't think Colorado had the players or the game plan to go in there and steal a win. I think they can make it semi-close. Definitely make it interesting. Uh, run up the score a little bit. But that will be their first loss of the season. But that's okay. Ending non-conference 2-1 and one is totally fine by me. It gives us great motivation going into um, the Pac-12 schedule. That next week, week four, we come home, and unfortunately, of course, we have to play defending champions, the Oregon Ducks. Um, while they did lose Justin Herbert, um, and they have a new offensive line, they're just a better team than us. Their defense is too good. Their offensive weapons are too good. Colorado is not on the same level as Oregon. Um, unfortunately, that is a, another loss for us. So we fall to two and two, and after that week was going to be our, wife, our bye week. And honestly, I have no complaints going into the bye week. Two and two. We lost to two really good teams. We did get, we did steal two wins. I think it's time that Carl Durrell can reset his team, bring them back down to earth, help them figure their form, and then go into the meat of the Pac-12 schedule. After that bye week, we then traveled to Tucson to take on Arizona. Um, we have had a lot of struggles in the past against Arizona. Last year, they beat us on Parents Weekend, an atrocious game. We absolutely collapsed. They ran all over us. But I think this year is much different. We march in there. We have a great game. Our offense excels. Our defense excels. We steal a game in Tucson. We increase our record to three and two. That next week, we come home to UCLA, um, much like Arizona. For some reason, we have struggles against the mediocre Pac-12 teams. But things change this year. We win that game. We prove that we are not a contender in the Pac-12, but we definitely mean business. We get that win. We become 4-2. and two. We're looking good so far. This next two stretches of games is quite unfortunate. Two of the Pac-12 contenders. We have a home game against ASU. Yes, we went into um, Tempe last year, beat a ranked Arizona State team, but Jaden Daniels was still a little unproven. Um, now that he has a full year of college football under his belt, he comes into Folsom Field and shreds our defense, makes Colorado look absolutely silly. Um, ASU gets the win. We go to four and three. And then we have to travel to Southern California to play in the Coliseum against the Trojans. Um, like I said last year, they came to us last year. Really close game, kind of collapsed in the fourth quarter. I really thought we could have pulled out that win. But we go into uh, Los Angeles against a Heisman candidate in Keaton Slovis. Again, much like, much like Daniels did to us, Keaton Slovis absolutely shreds our defense. Uh, I think we can make it decently close, but it's going to be a very high-scoring affair. Both teams will be at least 30 points, but USC gets the edge just because offensively and defensively they're a much better team than Colorado. Then we go back to 500 at four and four. But that being said, we have lost games to serious Pac-12 contenders, where I think that if we can play well and prove that we belong, I think that shows a lot of promise for this football team. 
Um, after USC, after the two-game stretch against ASU and USC, we come back home to play Washington State. We got absolutely torched last year in Pullman, but we just did not look good that game. Uh, that being said, they come to full sum. I think we play one of our best games of the year, just an all-around complete game. Our offense clicks, our defense clicks. It, Washington State lost a lot of key components to their offense and defense. I think Colorado can get a win, go to 5-4, and four, only needing one more win to be bowl eligible. Surprising everybody, not only Colorado fans, but all Pac-12 fans and showing that Colorado is a team to reckon with. We then go at Stanford, and this is probably one of my hottest takes. I think we beat Stanford at Stanford. Um, we beat them last year. It was a really hard-fought win. We won on a game-winning field goal. I, I, I don't think Stanford got any better this past year. I think, yes, Colorado lost LaVisca and Steven Montez, but I definitely think we reloaded. We lost minimal parts of our defense that held that Stanford team to 13 points. And I think we come in, we, we steal a win in Palo Alto. We improve to 6-4 and four on the season. We are now bowl eligible since for the first time since 2016. I call it a successful season, but we still have two more games to play. We then go into Washington to play a very confusing Huskies team. They have a new coach, a new quarterback. Um... Definitely a, a weird transition year for them. They're still going to be good, but this is definitely a game that I think Colorado can come in and shock a lot of people. I think with this amount of turmoil that Washington's having, I think the stability that Colorado has, given that they're already 6-4, and four, they have, they're have they bowl eligible, they, they're feeling confident. I think they go in, they steal, they steal a win, and they shock a lot of people, I think. We can really prove ourselves that we now belong in the Pac-12. Talked about it a little, more, little, a little more in my other episode, how we don't belong. But I think this year we prove it. We improved to 7-4. and four. And then finally, in our last game of the season, we come home. We play a very, very talented Utah team, much like the games against USC, ASU, Oregon. We can't compete. Their talent is just that much better. But honestly, we go 7-5, and five, I think, we shock a lot of people's expectations. Like I said, not only Colorado fans, but Pac-12 fans and college football fans. When we make a bowl, we don't even got to win the bowl. But we show that Colorado football is now back. We have trust in Carl Durrell. We have trust in our recruiting classes. We have trust that this team can become a better team. And I think the, the season is a complete success. I think even now, even with the shortened season, even my predictions don't change. Um... So yeah, seven and five, six and six. We go five hundred. We go one game over five hundred. We become bowl eligible for the first time since twenty sixteen. We shock a lot of people. It's a, a successful season. We have a lot of momentum, not only going into the bowl game but going next season. And I think we can become a, a, another big player in the Pac twelve once again. Um, talking about being a big player, I think there there's a there's a hotly contested. Um, conversation going around to you, and that is, who is Colorado's best player of all time? Now, Colorado isn't exactly known for producing these fantastic, talented guys, but along but along its history, it's definitely had some elite guys. I think the, the most obvious name is Rashawn Salam. He was a running back who played for CU in 1992 to 1994, winning the Heisman in 1994. He was by far the best college football player during his three to three and four years, he played at Colorado. He got taken first uh, in the first round by the Bears. Had a really successful um, rookie season with the Bears. Rushed for uh, just under a thousand yards, but unfortunately, um, he couldn't stay on the field. He got injured, and then tragically took his own life a couple years later. Um, he, if he would have, if he could have stayed healthy, I think he would have been a fantastic NFL talent, and he could have definitely put. Colorado on the map for the type of players it has. Um, another player is Byron White. Uh, he played back in the early years of Colorado football around the 1940s, 50s. Hold a ton of records at CU. Uh, whenever we, whenever CU's football legacy is talked about, it's always ta it's always um, Byron White. All everything he did for the university, his football career, uh, what he did for the university after his football career, his army time, all that kind of stuff, and he's definitely someone that Colorado looks up to. But in my personal opinion, I think Rashawn Salam is the best player to come out of Colorado, surely based off of 
his absolute dominance in college football during the 1990s, the early 1990s. He, yes, he did come two years after uh, Colorado won their championship in 1990, but he absolutely shredded college football. Um, he was never one to enjoy the spotlight. Uh, I read a really good article about when he won the Heisman Trophy. He didn't want it. He thought it belonged to the rest of his team because he couldn't have got there without their help. Um, he Obviously, he was good enough to get drafted in the first round by the Bears. Had a really good rookie season, but unfortunately, like I said, things just kind of started to unravel after that. Um, and uh, if he stayed healthy, he could have been a really good talent. Um, he definitely... Definitely holds a strong uh, a strong place in the hearts of Colorado fans, um, and he is the best player to come out of Colorado football. On a similar note, I'm going to talk about the best the current the best current CU Buff player in the NFL. Um, there is actually quite a few kind of under the radar unknown ones. Um, the biggest name is Philip Lindsay, currently the running one of the running backs for the Denver Broncos. He um, had a breakout year in 2016 when Colorado had a, a, the really successful year. He put his name on the map, but he was not drafted. He became an a undrafted free agent, signed with the Broncos, really impressed the Broncos in training camp and preseason. So at the start of the season, he became the third running back on that, on that roster, uh, fought his way to get playing time. And then the year after that, uh, he made history for being the first undrafted rookie for to rush for a thousand yards in consecutive years. He took the NFL by storm. Uh, he gave that Broncos offense a definite fresh uh, breath of fresh air. They definitely needed it. He made the Pro Bowl. Uh, he put his name on the map as an established running back in the NFL. Nowadays, we all know how hard that is. Um, but he is definitely one of the big names to come out of Colorado football. My second one, who I think is up there for the best, who might be a little hot take, is LaVisca Chenault Jr. Now, he hasn't played a single snap of an actual NFL game, but coming out of college, he was a highly recruited, highly talented wide receiver. Some said he was even, even top five in that super deep uh, wide receiver class that we had last year. Um, he did get injured, which kind of lit, which why he sled. All the, that's why he slid all the way to where he did, but he is explosive with yards after the catch. He's extremely hard tackle. He's super versatile. He can play any side of the field, in the slot, in the backfield. He's a basically a Swiss Army knife for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I think he is definitely someone to look out for as a possible Rookie of the Year candidate just because the Jacksonville Jaguars are definitely in need of offensive Weapons, and I think if LaVisca can have a big breakout season, maybe not win Offensive Rookie of the Year, but prove himself as a as someone who they can rely on, I think that definitely makes a big name for himself when it comes to who the best player in the NFL is in terms of CU Buffs. Um, another big uh, name is David Bakhtiari. Now, he is an offensive lineman for the Green Bay Packers, and he is... Probably my favorite player on the NFL. He is absolutely elite, um, especially playing on Aaron Rodgers' blind side. A blind side is QB's worst nightmare. He is the most one of the most reliable offensive linemen I've ever watched play football. He's definitely an absolute treat to watch. Um, he was really good in Colorado, got drafted, and immediately made an impact in the NFL. Um, the Packers saw widely of him, gave him a huge contract. He's made... I believe four to five Pro Bowls in his career. He's constantly on the NFL top 100 list. He is probably the best uh, player in his position, um, and he he enjoys playing the game of football. He represents not only the Packers well, but he also represents the Colorado Buffaloes really well. And he is up there as the top CU buff. And lastly, which is might have a little bit of surprise, the top CU. Currently buff in the NFL is Mason Crosby. Like David Bakhtiari, he is on the Green Bay Packers. He is their field goal kicker, a place kicker. He, he is automatic. He is arguably one of the best kickers in the NFL currently. He had a great year last year when all of the NFL kickers 
struggled a lot. He he was um, he got a really big contract this past year from the Packers because of his reliability. He's been with the Packers his whole entire career. He won the Super Bowl with them, and he is someone who the Packers rely on, especially when Aaron Rodgers isn't having a really good offensive game. And I think that out of the four of them, I think that David Bocciari is by far the best CU buff in the NFL, just in terms of his ability to play his position at an elite level, his ability to um, represent not only the Packers really well, but represent Colorado really well, and his ability to understand that his his role in the NFL and on an offensive line is by far the crucial protecting Aaron Rodgers' blind side. And simple as that, he is the best CU buff currently in the NFL by a good amount. I'd say um, Philip Lindsay is in a close second, then uh, Mason Crosby. And I think Visca is a little unproven. That's why I put him at number four. But like I said, if he can have a breakout season, he can prove people that he can be an explosive receiver after the catch and provide a safety net for that Jaguar offense, which is struggling. He definitely moves up on the list. There's definitely a a common theme through these players that they all came out of CU. And when they were at CU, CU was at its best. Right now, CU is definitely at a pretty low level. You know, they're, they're struggling. They got a new coach. Mel Tucker left them in probably the worst way possible. That being said, is there a bright future for Colorado? I think there is. If you're to take one thing out of this whole situation with Mel Tucker and the hiring of Carl Durrell in the 5-7 and seven season is that Colorado gets a fresh start. Colorado has very, I personally, has very low but doable expectations this upcoming year. I think uh, I, I touched on it in one of my videos that Carl Durrell has to at least go 6-6, six and six, which I think when I went through that schedule is a very doable thing. Make it possibly even go 7-5. Seven, seven, but if they go 500, I think that is definitely starting a trend upward. Um, they have a really good 2020 recruiting class. Their 2021 and 2022 recruiting classes are filling out very nicely. I think Carl Durrell is doing a really good job to not only keep the people that Mel Tucker recruited – but he's also doing a really good job amid all of this COVID-19 madness, doing a really good job to make personal connections with the players he's recruiting, telling them the, the reasons the reasons they want to hear as to why Colorado is a great place to play football and why Colorado is on the up. You know, 2016 was a very uh, was an anomaly season. And I think that if Colorado can find that form that they had in 2016, they definitely can start trending upwards and have a super bright future. Um, I think in general, Colorado is a a great place to come play college football. It's historic. It's one of the best um, stadiums and not only in the Pac-12, but in in college football. You have a great view of the Flatirons. Uh, you play at altitude, you have an advantage. You train at altitude, you're better when you go to schools like UCLA and USC that are sea level. It shows on the field. It speaks for itself. Um, yeah, so Colorado is definitely trending upwards in terms of their future. Um, I think it's definitely going to hurt losing Visca and Steven Montez. You know, Visca was just such an ex- such an explosive player uh last year um he was just an absolute beast absolutely shredded the pac 12 when he was healthy um he was unstoppable uh montez had a great arm but he his pocket awareness was was minimal he took sacks that he shouldn't have but i think in general um colorado isn't losing a lot in terms of him they have uh Really good players coming in, not only who were already on the team, but the recruiting staff. Uh, but when it really comes down to it, I think Carl, Carl Durrell is going to make all the difference. Um, people don't have a lot of trust in him, but if he can come in, start trending Colorado on the upwards, at least go 6-6, six and six, win the winnable games that needs to be won, I think Colorado definitely has the um, opportunity to... Um, be successful program again 
start recruiting the good players again and be a top program in the Pac-12 and not have to move out of the Pac-12 like I mentioned in my last video. So bottom line, like I said before, Colorado's future is bright, even though it may not look like it like now. We just got to trust the process. Um, we, we know Colorado fans have trusted the process for, was it four years now since that 2016 season? People trusted Mel Tucker's process, but we know how that uh, ended up. Um, but like I said, bottom line, Carl Durrell needs to come in, make good with what he has now, get his recruiting class in, win the winnable games, go six and six, put Colorado back on the map and be that coach, be that reliable coach that not only Colorado players are looking for, but the athletic department's looking for, fans are looking for. Be the one, be the be the guy who can anchor this team into success and propel Colorado into a brighter future. And if you can do that, I see a win-win. You know, we have a very, very dual, we had a very, we have a very doable schedule, winnable games. Yes, we're gonna lose games, but if we can make the games we lose competitive, I think that Colorado can have a bright future. Well, thank you so much, guys. I This is a bit of a shorter show, um, but I really appreciate you guys sticking with me. Um, uh, like I said, if you want to uh, see the clips, see the full show, um, follow us on social media, at Dashboards TV on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Uh, if you want to go read up about me, see my shows, see my other uh, other co-host shows, I definitely recommend that. Uh, there's some really good shows on there from the other Pac-12 schools. Um, and I really appreciate you guys coming out. Um, next week, have another great show full of content. And thank you so much. Have a great day.